It was a warm evening in the heart of the city, and the upscale restaurant La Belle Table was bustling with activity. The scent of freshly cooked meals mixed with the soft murmur of conversations and dim candlelight flickered across the faces of the city's elite. The clinking of glasses and the soft shuffle of waiters in their crisp uniforms contributed to the elegant atmosphere. Seated alone at a corner table was Malcolm Wright, a tall, well-dressed black man in his mid-forties. His presence commanded respect, yet his demeanor was calm, almost humble. His tailored suit hinted at his professional status, but there was an air of mystery about him that set him apart from the other patrons. Tonight, he wasn't here for a political fundraiser, nor to meet any important dignitaries. This was Malcolm's moment of peace, a quiet dinner to reflect after a grueling day of debates, meetings, and political skirmishes. Malcolm, who had served as a state senator for over a decade, had seen it all. He was a fierce advocate for civil rights and justice, often speaking out on issues of inequality. However, despite his public persona, Malcolm valued humility. He rarely flaunted his title unless necessary, preferring to be seen as a man of the people rather than an untouchable figure of authority. As Malcolm browsed the menu, his attention was momentarily pulled by the chatter from a nearby table. A group of businessmen laughed loudly, their animated conversation revolving around deals and profits. Across the restaurant, couples shared intimate conversations, oblivious to the rest of the world. It was a typical evening in a place where the wealthy came to dine and unwind. Just as Malcolm set his menu down, waiting to order, Steve, a middle-aged white waiter with a stiff posture and a thin, forced smile, approached his table. There was something off about Steve's body language, a slight hesitation, a sense of discomfort that Malcolm immediately noticed. Instead of the professional politeness expected in such a high-end establishment, Steve's tone was cold, his eyes briefly scanning Malcolm with a look that Malcolm had seen too many times before. What can I get you? Steve asked, his voice devoid of the warmth and courtesy he'd shown the previous table just moments earlier. Malcolm, ever composed, smiled. I'll start with a glass of water and would like to order the lamb shank. Steve raised an eyebrow, his expression turning sour. Are you sure? It's quite expensive, he remarked, glancing Malcolm up and down, as if assessing whether or not he belonged in the restaurant. There was a slight pause as Malcolm processed the comment. He had encountered this sort of treatment before, being judged by the color of his skin rather than the content of his character. But tonight, he wasn't in the mood for confrontation. At least, not yet. Malcolm kept his cool, deciding not to escalate the situation. That will be fine, he said evenly, his eyes locking with Steve's for a brief moment. Steve gave a curt nod before walking away, muttering something under his breath that Malcolm couldn't quite catch but could easily guess the tone of. The discomfort in the air was palpable now, and even a few nearby patrons seemed to sense something was off. Malcolm sighed, tapping his fingers lightly on the table. He was no stranger to subtle racism. He had experienced it in meetings, public spaces, and now, even during a simple meal. But what Steve didn't know was that the man he was so casually disrespecting was a state senator with significant influence someone who had the power to make real change in a world still plagued by such ignorance. As Malcolm sipped his water, his thoughts wandered back to the political struggles he had faced recently, debating new civil rights legislation, fighting systemic bias, and speaking up for the disenfranchised. And now here he was, facing the very thing he worked so hard to dismantle, prejudice wrapped in the guise of customer service, a few moments passed, and Malcolm noticed that other tables were receiving their meals, while Steve seemed to intentionally delay his order. He could feel the eyes of others glancing toward him, curiosity mixed with unease. This was the kind of thing that happened when the invisible barriers of race and class collided in public spaces. Malcolm had seen it time and time again, people like Steve, who made assumptions, who didn't see the person in front of them, only the stereotypes they carried in their heads. Still, Malcolm remained calm, observing the room and quietly planning how he would handle the situation. He wasn't the type to cause a scene unnecessarily, but he also wasn't the type to let such blatant disrespect slide. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, Steve returned, his attitude no better than before.
You're still waiting on that lamb, huh? Steve said, half smirking as he placed the bread basket on the table. It might take a while. Malcolm simply nodded, not giving Steve the satisfaction of a reaction. Instead, he leaned back in his chair, fully aware that this night was heading toward an inevitable confrontation, one that Steve had unknowingly set in motion. As the minutes dragged on, Malcolm's patience remained intact, though his mind was already considering the next steps. The subtle, quiet racism from Steve had not gone unnoticed by others in the restaurant. A couple at the neighboring table exchanged uneasy glances, whispering to one another, their eyes flicking between Malcolm and the waiter. Others around the room were aware of the growing tension, but as was typical in such settings, they chose to stay quiet, observing but not intervening. Malcolm glanced at his watch. His food was now considerably late, far beyond the normal wait time. The waiter's deliberate avoidance of his table was no longer subtle. Steve had completely stopped approaching him and had turned his attention to other guests, acting as if Malcolm didn't exist. It wasn't lost on Malcolm that he could have spoken up earlier. Many would have by now, perhaps demanded to see the manager or made a fuss, but Malcolm had always believed in picking his battles. There was power in restraint, in watching the situation unfold, allowing people like Steve to dig themselves deeper into the hole of their prejudice. At this point, the dinner Malcolm had hoped would be a peaceful respite from the outside world had turned into something entirely different. He would have to address the disrespect, and when he did, Steve was going to regret it. As the room hummed with the low conversation of other diners, Malcolm raised his hand calmly, catching the eye of another waiter who was passing by. This waiter, a younger man named Chris, immediately came over, his posture respectful and professional. Excuse me, Malcolm began, his tone polite but firm. I've been waiting for my meal for quite some time. Could you check on my order? Chris blinked, taken aback by the clear oversight. Of course, sir. I'll look into it right away he said with a slight nod, quickly disappearing into the kitchen. From across the room, Steve watched, his expression tightening as he noticed Chris speaking with Malcolm. He wasn't concerned yet. After all, he'd managed to get away with such behavior before. To Steve, Malcolm was just another customer who didn't belong, a black man in an upscale establishment he probably couldn't afford. Minutes later, Chris returned, looking somewhat uncomfortable. I'm sorry for the delay, sir. It seems there was some confusion in the kitchen. Your meal is being prepared right now. Malcolm gave him a nod of acknowledgement, though he could see through the excuse. There was no confusion in the kitchen. The issue was with Steve, and Malcolm knew it. Thank you, Chris, Malcolm said with a quiet authority that hinted he was no ordinary patron. I'd also like to speak to the manager when you have a moment. Chris nodded quickly sensing that the situation was more serious than it appeared on the surface. I'll notify the manager right away. As Chris left to find the manager, Malcolm sat back, folding his hands in his lap. He was still calm, his demeanor steady, but now the other patrons were paying closer attention. The whispers were getting louder, and a few people were even staring openly. It was clear that something was about to happen something that would expose the reality beneath the polished surface of this fine establishment. Moments later, the manager, Rachel, approached the table with a professional smile. She was in her early forties, dressed impeccably in black, with a name tag pinned to her blouse. As she reached Malcolm's table, she could feel the eyes of the restaurant on her. This wasn't the kind of scene that normally unfolded here. Good evening, sir. My name is Rachel. I'm the manager here. I understand there's been some delay with your order, she said, her voice carrying a polite concern. Malcolm looked up at her, his gaze steady. Yes, there's been quite a delay, but that's not the only issue, he replied, his voice calm but firm. I've been waiting for my meal for a long time, but the service I've received from one of your waitstaff has been less than acceptable. Rachel's smile faltered, though she maintained her professionalism. I'm very sorry to hear that, sir. I'll address it right away. Which staff member are you referring to? Malcolm didn't have to answer. Steve, who had been watching from a distance, was now approaching, seemingly unaware of the storm he was walking into. His expression was one of mild annoyance, 
as if this situation was just a small inconvenience in his otherwise smooth evening. He had no idea who he was dealing with. Is there a problem here? Steve asked, his voice carrying a dismissive tone. His eyes flicked to Rachel, as if expecting her to back him up. Malcolm turned his attention to Steve, his expression unreadable. He didn't speak immediately, letting the tension hang in the air. Rachel, sensing something was off, stepped slightly closer to Steve, as if trying to defuse the situation before it escalated further. There is a problem, Malcolm said, his voice level but cutting through the air like a blade. The problem is that I've been treated with disrespect since the moment I sat down. Steve opened his mouth to respond, but Malcolm continued, not allowing him the opportunity. You've made assumptions about me, haven't you? Malcolm asked, his eyes locking with Steve's. You've decided that because of the way I look, I don't belong here, that I can't afford to be in this restaurant. Isn't that right? Steve blinked, clearly caught off guard by Malcolm's directness. His usual smug demeanor was starting to crumble, but he still tried to maintain control of the situation. I didn't mean anything by it, Steve muttered, though his voice lacked conviction. I was just doing my job. Malcolm's eyes narrowed slightly, the calm exterior still in place, but there was now an undeniable intensity behind his gaze. If this is how you do your job, then you've clearly misunderstood what it means to serve people. Rachel's face had gone pale. She could see where this was headed, and her mind was racing to find a way to salvage the situation. I apologize, sir. I'll handle this immediately, she said quickly, cutting into the exchange before Steve could say something he couldn't take back. But Malcolm wasn't finished. Do you know who I am? He asked, his voice low but filled with authority. It wasn't a question meant to intimidate, but one meant to remind Steve and everyone else in the restaurant of the consequences of making assumptions based on race. Steve shifted uncomfortably. No, I don't he stammered, suddenly realizing that this was no ordinary customer. Malcolm leaned forward slightly, his voice steady and commanding. I'm Senator Malcolm Wright. The words hung in the air, sinking into the room like a stone dropped into a still pond. There was an audible gasp from a few patrons nearby, and Steve's face drained of color as he stared at Malcolm, realization dawning on him. The atmosphere in the restaurant shifted dramatically the moment Malcolm revealed his identity. For a few seconds, everything seemed to freeze. Steve stood motionless, his smugness replaced by disbelief, his mouth slightly agape. Nearby patrons, who had been observing the interaction from the sidelines, exchanged wide-eyed glances, some whispering in shock. Rachel, the manager, took a sharp breath. Her hands clasped tightly in front of her as she attempted to regain control of the situation. Senator Wright, she began, her voice laced with urgency. I am so incredibly sorry. I had no idea. Malcolm held up his hand, stopping her mid-sentence. This isn't about who I am, he said calmly, though his voice carried a weight that filled the room. It's about how I've been treated, and more importantly, why. Steve's face flushed red with embarrassment, his posture rigid and uncomfortable. He looked as if he wanted to shrink away, but instead he stood frozen, unable to find any words to defend himself. The tension was palpable and the quiet murmur that had filled the restaurant earlier was now replaced by an uneasy silence. Malcolm took a sip of his water, pausing briefly before continuing. You see, this is exactly the problem. Every day, people of color walk into places like this and are judged before they even have a chance to speak. You saw me and made assumptions, assumptions that I didn't belong, that I couldn't afford to be here. You disrespected me without knowing anything about me. His words cut through the air like a knife, and Steve's eyes darted to the floor, his face now fully drained of any remaining confidence. The weight of Malcolm's position was now apparent to him, but it was too late to undo what had been done. I'm sorry, Steve mumbled, though it was clear the apology was more out of fear than genuine remorse. Malcolm's gaze softened, but only slightly. Sorry isn't enough, Steve. It's not just about this one interaction. This is bigger than you and me. He glanced around the room, making sure his words were heard by everyone. It's about the ingrained biases we carry, the ones we don't even think about until they've already done harm. What happened here tonight isn't an isolated incident. 
It's part of a much larger problem. Rachel, still standing beside Steve, stepped forward. Senator, please accept my deepest apologies on behalf of the restaurant, she said, her voice trembling slightly. I assure you this is not how we conduct business, and we will take immediate action to rectify this situation. Malcolm regarded her for a moment, measuring her sincerity. I appreciate your apology, but I'm not here for free meals or special treatment. What I want is accountability. His gaze flicked back to Steve, who was now visibly sweating, shifting uncomfortably under the pressure. We'll take action, Rachel promised. Steve will be dealt with and will implement mandatory training for our staff. We'll ensure this never happens again. Malcolm nodded slowly, though he wasn't entirely convinced by the typical corporate response. He had heard these promises before, empty words designed to placate in the moment, only for the status quo to return the next day. We'll see, he said, his tone neutral but heavy with meaning. As the tension in the room hung thick, Malcolm noticed the lingering stares from nearby tables. Some patrons seemed genuinely shocked by the turn of events, while others looked uncomfortable, as if Malcolm's presence had disrupted their quiet, privileged dining experience. A few even seemed annoyed, as though this confrontation had tainted their otherwise peaceful night out. And that's when Malcolm decided it was time to speak to the room. He slowly rose from his chair, standing tall and composed. His presence commanded the attention of everyone in the restaurant, and those who hadn't been paying attention before were now locked in, captivated by what was unfolding. This is not just about me, Malcolm began, his voice carrying across the room, calm but authoritative. This is about how we treat one another, how we let prejudice and bias dictate our actions, often without even realizing it. What happened here tonight is just one example of a much larger issue, one that affects people of color every day. He paused, allowing his words to sink in. The patrons watched, some looking uncomfortable, others hanging on every word, clearly moved by the senator's powerful presence. I walk into this restaurant, Malcolm continued, and because of my skin color, I'm treated as less than. But imagine if I wasn't a senator. Imagine if I was just any other black man walking in here for a quiet meal. Would anyone care about how I was treated? Would anyone speak up? Or would it be easier to look away, pretend not to notice? The room was silent. Malcolm could feel the discomfort in the air, but he didn't shy away from it. This was a moment of reckoning, one he hoped would resonate beyond the confines of the restaurant. Racism isn't always loud. It isn't always obvious. Sometimes it's subtle. It's the way you get ignored, the way people assume things about you before you've even spoken a word. It's the service that never comes. It's the way you're made to feel like you don't belong. Malcolm's words carried a gravity that silenced the room. Even the clinking of silverware had ceased as everyone absorbed the weight of the senator's message. The truth he spoke was undeniable. And in this moment, everyone in the room was forced to confront the quiet racism that had played out before their eyes. Steve, still standing by the table, looked like a man who wanted to disappear. The gravity of what he had done was fully sinking in now, and the cold, dismissive attitude he had displayed earlier had completely vanished, replaced by regret and shame. Rachel, too, seemed shaken by the senator's speech. She stood by, her arms crossed in front of her, nodding solemnly as Malcolm spoke. We will do better, Senator, she said quietly, though the promise seemed small in the face of such a large issue. Malcolm didn't respond immediately. Instead, he surveyed the room one last time, meeting the eyes of the patrons who had been watching. He hoped that, after tonight, they would think differently, not just about how they treated others, but how they allowed the world around them to function. As Malcolm's words settled into the room, the tension remained thick, but the weight of his message had shifted the atmosphere. No longer were the patrons simply observing a disgruntled customer or an awkward moment between waiter and diner. Now they were witnessing something far deeper, a conversation about the systemic racism that permeated even the most seemingly innocuous spaces. Steve, still standing at Malcolm's table, shifted uneasily, his earlier bravado completely shattered. His eyes darted nervously toward Rachel, who stood quietly, visibly uncomfortable but keenly aware of the gravity of the situation. The manager's earlier attempt at damage control now seemed insufficient. 
This wasn't just a small inconvenience to be swept under the rug. It was a public reckoning. Malcolm, still standing tall, turned his attention back to Rachel. I appreciate your words, Rachel, he said, his voice measured and controlled, but words alone won't change anything. It's actions that matter. Rachel nodded quickly, a mix of shame and urgency in her expression. You're absolutely right, Senator. I assure you, we will be implementing changes immediately. This will not be taken lightly. Malcolm raised an eyebrow, his face calm, but his eyes reflecting the experience of someone who had heard promises like these many times before. He was all too familiar with the cycle. An incident happens, apologies are made, pledges for change are issued, and then nothing happens. The underlying issues remain, simmering beneath the surface, waiting to erupt again in another setting with another victim. I'm not looking for personal retribution, Malcolm said, his voice carrying a steady, quiet authority. What I want is for you to understand the impact of what happened here tonight. Steve's actions are not just about poor service or a bad attitude. They're about the assumptions he made based on the color of my skin. And that's a deeper problem. Rachel nodded again, her face earnest but strained. I understand, Senator. We'll do better. We'll provide training and we'll make sure this never happens again. Steve, still reeling from the realization that he had disrespected a state senator, stammered out another weak apology. I, I'm sorry, Senator. I didn't realize. Malcolm met Steve's gaze, and for the first time since the interaction had begun, his tone softened slightly. Steve, he began, it's not about whether or not you knew who I was. It's about why you assumed what you did. That's what needs to change. Steve nodded slowly, his face pale, realizing the full extent of his mistake. I understand, he mumbled, though his understanding was likely shallow, driven more by the immediate consequences of his actions than a deep reflection on his own biases. Rachel, sensing that Steve's presence was only making the situation worse, cleared her throat. Steve, I think it's best if you head to the back. I'll take care of things from here, she said, her tone firm but not unkind. Steve glanced at Malcolm once more, his face full of regret, before retreating toward the kitchen, his shoulders slumped in defeat. The eyes of the room followed him as he left, and the silence that lingered in his absence was heavy with both judgment and introspection. With Steve gone, Malcolm sat back down, his composed demeanor never wavering. Rachel stood by, unsure of what more she could say or do to right the wrong that had been done. The restaurant's patrons remained quiet, still processing what they had witnessed. Some were clearly uncomfortable, shifting in their seats as if they'd prefer to forget the confrontation had ever happened. Others seemed contemplative, their gazes lingering on Malcolm with a mix of curiosity and respect. Senator, Rachel began after a long pause, I truly hope you can accept our sincerest apologies. I know this doesn't fix what happened, but I want you to know that we are committed to making real changes this won't be swept under the rug. Malcolm looked up at her, his expression thoughtful. I hope so, Rachel. I really do, he said, his tone suggesting that while he appreciated her intentions, he wasn't yet convinced. Too many times he had been promised change, only to see those promises broken. Rachel fumbled slightly with her hands, clearly wanting to do more. Is there anything else we can do for you tonight? Your meal is, of course, on the house, she offered though she quickly realized that such an offer felt hollow in the face of what had transpired. Malcolm shook his head. I'm not interested in free meals, he replied firmly. What I'm interested in is systemic change. It's not enough to apologize after the fact. The culture needs to shift. Rachel nodded, her face flushed with both embarrassment and determination. We'll do everything we can, she said again though Malcolm could sense that she was as much at a loss for how to handle the situation as anyone else. A few moments passed in awkward silence before Rachel excused herself, promising once more that actions would be taken, that Steve would be dealt with, and that the restaurant would begin implementing changes to ensure such incidents would never happen again. She walked away, her shoulders heavy with the weight of the encounter. Malcolm watched her go, feeling a mix of exhaustion and resolve. He had handled the situation as calmly and professionally as he always did, but the weight of these interactions never got any lighter.
Each time, it reminded him of how far society still had to go in addressing racism, not just the overt kind, but the subtle, quiet prejudices that followed people of color in every corner of their lives. As the restaurant slowly returned to its usual rhythm, Malcolm leaned back in his chair and took a deep breath. The confrontation had passed, but the impact lingered, not just for him, but for everyone who had witnessed it. He hoped that they would leave the restaurant with a greater understanding of the small, insidious ways that racism worked its way into everyday interactions. In the background, the soft murmur of conversations resumed, though they were quieter now, as if the restaurant's usual light-hearted atmosphere had been permanently altered by what had taken place. Malcolm noticed a few patrons throwing him sympathetic glances, though none of them approached him directly. He wasn't looking for sympathy, though. He wasn't looking for any acknowledgement of his power or his status. What he wanted was for people like Steve to think twice before making assumptions about someone based on their appearance. What he wanted was for real change to take root, not just in this restaurant, but in every space where people of color were made to feel less than. As Malcolm sat there, his meal finally arriving, he couldn't help but reflect on how often people like Steve people who probably thought of themselves as decent, fair individuals, were so unaware of their own biases. It was these quiet, everyday moments of racism that were the hardest to combat because they were often invisible to everyone but the person experiencing them. As Malcolm sat at his table, the events of the evening continued to play out in his mind. The lamb shank had finally arrived, carefully plated and still steaming, but Malcolm barely touched it. His appetite had been dulled by the weight of the situation, though he knew that tonight's confrontation had been a necessary one. He wasn't angry. He rarely allowed himself that emotion in public. But he was tired, tired of these encounters. Tired of the expectations placed upon him to always respond with calm and grace when faced with blatant disrespect. Across the room, the other diners were slowly beginning to return to their conversations, though the mood had shifted noticeably. The lighthearted laughter and animated discussions that had filled the restaurant earlier had been replaced by a more subdued, introspective atmosphere. Every now and then, Malcolm caught someone looking his way, some with empathy, others with uncertainty, as if unsure how to process what they had just witnessed. Malcolm glanced at his watch. It was getting late, and though he had planned to stay and enjoy a quiet meal, he now felt the urge to leave to step out into the cool night air and shake off the remnants of the evening's tension. Just as he was about to call for the check, a voice interrupted his thoughts. Senator Wright? Malcolm looked up to see a man approaching his table. He was in his early fifties, well-dressed in a tailored suit, and wore an expression of genuine concern. His wife, who had been sitting a few tables over, stood nearby, watching the interaction with a similar look of unease. I just wanted to say... The man hesitated for a moment, choosing his words carefully. I'm deeply sorry for what happened tonight. I watched the whole thing and, well, it wasn't right. You handled it with such grace. Malcolm offered the man a polite nod, though he was still wary of these kinds of interactions. Often, people expressed their sympathy in these moments, but rarely did they take any action beyond words. Thank you, Malcolm said, his tone respectful but distant. It's something I've unfortunately grown used to. The man winced at Malcolm's response, clearly unsettled by the idea that this kind of treatment was something the senator had to endure regularly. I can't imagine what it must be like, he said, his voice lowering as if he was embarrassed by the admission. But I want you to know, there are people who see it, who understand. Malcolm smiled, though it was more out of politeness than anything else. I appreciate that, he said. But seeing isn't enough. It's what we do about it that matters. The man nodded, his face flushed with a mix of shame and understanding. You're right, of course, he replied. It's just, sometimes it feels like such a big problem. I don't know where to start. Malcolm's eyes softened as he looked at the man. He had heard this sentiment so many times before. People who genuinely wanted to help but felt overwhelmed by the enormity of the issue. Start by speaking up, Malcolm said his voice gentle but firm. In moments like this, when you see something wrong, don't just watch. Don't just let it happen. 
Say something. Do something. It doesn't have to be big, but if we all start doing that, we can make a difference. The man nodded again, his expression thoughtful. You're right, Senator. I'll remember that. Thank you. With that, he gave Malcolm a respectful nod and returned to his table, his wife reaching out to squeeze his hand as he sat back down. Malcolm watched them for a moment, hoping that their conversation had planted a seed of action, something that would grow into a real commitment to change, not just a fleeting moment of discomfort. As the night wore on, Malcolm remained seated for a little while longer, sipping his water and allowing the tension to leave his body. He could feel the weight of the day's events pulling at him, but there was also a sense of resolution. This wasn't the first time he had faced this kind of situation, and it certainly wouldn't be the last. But each time, he knew that his response mattered, that how he handled these moments could leave an impact on those who witnessed them, even if it was just one person who walked away with a changed perspective. Just as Malcolm was about to stand and leave, Rachel returned, this time with a much more measured approach. Her earlier nervousness had been replaced by a calm, resolute demeanor. She stood beside Malcolm's table, her hands folded in front of her. Senator Wright, she began, I know you've heard a lot of apologies tonight, but I want to assure you that we are committed to doing better. I've already spoken with the owner of the restaurant, and we're taking immediate steps to ensure that our staff receives proper training on how to treat all of our customers with the respect they deserve. Malcolm nodded, though he remained cautious. That's a good start, he said, but make sure this isn't just about damage control. This is about more than what happened tonight. It's about how we create environments where everyone feels like they belong, no matter who they are. Rachel's expression softened, and Malcolm could see that his words were having an effect. I understand, she said, and I will personally see to it that changes are made. You have my word. Malcolm regarded her for a moment, sensing the sincerity in her voice. Thank you, he replied. I'll be watching. Rachel offered a small, respectful nod and excused herself, leaving Malcolm alone once more. He watched as she walked back toward the kitchen, her steps more measured, more thoughtful than before. The night was drawing to a close, and the restaurant had begun to empty out. As Malcolm gathered his things and prepared to leave, he felt a sense of resolve settling within him. He had handled the evening with the dignity and strength that he had built his career on. But more importantly, he had once again used his position to shine a light on the quiet, insidious forms of racism that so often went unchecked. As he stepped out into the cool night air, Malcolm looked up at the city skyline, the lights twinkling above him like distant stars. He knew that the road to change was long, often frustrating, and filled with setbacks. But he also knew that moments like these, small, seemingly insignificant interactions, were the building blocks of something much larger. Malcolm stepped out onto the sidewalk, the cool night air brushing against his face as he walked toward his car. The events of the evening still weighed on him, though he felt a sense of closure in how he had handled the situation. The restaurant behind him was quiet now, but the impact of the night's confrontation would linger long after he had left. As he approached his car, he heard hurried footsteps behind him. Senator Wright, Malcolm turned to see Rachel, the restaurant manager, jogging toward him, her breath slightly uneven from the rush. He paused, curious as to why she had followed him outside. Senator, Rachel began, catching her breath, I just wanted to say one more thing before you go. Malcolm turned fully to face her, giving her his full attention. He could see the sincerity in her eyes, but also something deeper, a need to make things right beyond the usual corporate apologies. I know tonight was difficult, Rachel said, her voice softer now that they were outside, away from the prying eyes of the restaurant. And I realized that the promises I made inside... Well, they're just words right now, but I really want you to know that I mean it. We're going to make changes, real changes. Malcolm studied her for a moment, sensing that there was more to her words than the usual platitudes. He nodded slowly. I appreciate that, Rachel. But like I said before, it's not about words, it's about action. Rachel nodded quickly, clearly determined to show that she understood. I've already started drafting plans for staff training, she continued, not just on customer service, 
but on racial bias and inclusivity. I know it's a small step, but I want this place to be different. I want it to be a place where everyone feels welcome, no matter who they are. Malcolm's expression softened slightly. He had heard promises like this before, but there was something in Rachel's tone that made him believe she truly wanted to make a difference. It's a good start, he said, but make sure it's consistent. It can't be a one-time thing. This kind of change takes time, and it needs to be ongoing. Rachel nodded again, her determination clear. It will be. I promise. I'm going to make sure Steve and the rest of the staff understand the importance of what happened tonight, and I'll make sure they learn from it. There was a moment of silence between them, the sounds of the city bustling in the background. Malcolm appreciated her words, but he also knew that real change was slow and hard won. Still, he had to believe that people could learn, that environments could shift if those in power were truly committed to change. I believe you, Malcolm finally said, his voice firm but kind. Just remember, this isn't just about avoiding bad press or keeping customers happy. It's about doing what's right, even when no one is watching. Rachel's eyes glistened with understanding, her face filled with both gratitude and a sense of responsibility. I know, and I won't forget that. Malcolm gave her a final nod, offering a small reassuring smile before turning toward his car. As he opened the door, Rachel called out one last time, Thank you, Senator Wright, for everything. Malcolm glanced over his shoulder, acknowledging her with a brief wave before slipping into the driver's seat. As he started the engine, he couldn't help but feel a sliver of hope. Hope that maybe, just maybe, this interaction would lead to real change, not just in that restaurant, but in the minds of everyone who had witnessed what happened. As he drove through the city streets, his thoughts drifted back to the faces of the diners, the way they had watched the confrontation unfold. He wondered how many of them had truly absorbed the message and how many would walk away unaffected content to return to their comfortable lives. Change was never easy. It often came slowly, in small, painful steps. But Malcolm had learned that sometimes those small steps were enough to start a ripple. He turned a corner and headed toward his home, the city lights flashing past him. His mind wandered to the countless other moments like this one, moments when he had been forced to confront racism in its various forms, from the blatant to the subtle. It was exhausting, always being on guard, always having to fight, but it was necessary. For as long as there were people like Steve, people who acted on their biases without thinking, there would be a need for people like Malcolm, willing to stand up and demand better. As he pulled into his driveway, Malcolm allowed himself a moment of reflection. The night had been long and difficult, but it wasn't without purpose. Every confrontation, Every uncomfortable conversation brought him one step closer to the world he envisioned. A world where people were judged by their character, not the color of their skin. Malcolm sat in his car for a few moments, the engine idling softly as he gathered his thoughts. He knew that the battle against racism was far from over, but tonight had been a small victory. Not just because he had stood up for himself, but because he had forced others to see, to reflect, and hopefully, to change. Finally, he turned off the engine and stepped out of the car, feeling the cool night air wrap around him once again. He took a deep breath, letting the tension of the day melt away, and walked toward his front door. As he unlocked it and stepped inside, a sense of calm washed over him. For tonight at least, he had done what he could. Tomorrow, the fight would continue, but for now, he allowed himself a moment of peace. As the door closed behind him, the sound of the city faded into the background and Malcolm Wright, a senator, a black man, and a fighter for justice, finally allowed himself to rest.